Greenfield is coming to talk, even as we speak now. And we would have no audience at all, because none of us actually has the pulling power of the Baroness Greenfield. <laughs> and really, we managed to meet some people, so thank you very much indeed. I have a particular tribute to Joe Trackler, who invited uh, myself, myself and, and to David, who, who responded. I thought David, in many ways, David Papineau, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of London, he is, to me, the ideal interlocutor, because he disagrees with me profoundly, articulately, and courteously. That's a strong uh, string of my idea. <laughs> so basically, I'm going to put forward the hypothesis, as you can see on the slide, why neuroscience will never explain human consciousness. And then I'm going to be reduced to a pyramid of dust uh, by David. And then, out of sheer pity, you will rise from the audience and try and reconstruct this living human body out of the remains of my reputation. That's roughly the, 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 the agenda. Um, uh, if anybody doesn't like blood sports, then they want all to leave now. But it won't be a blood sport, it'll be a, a big challenge. So it's a fantastic honour to be invited to talk here at the, uh, at the Think Week. I was a student here and I studied neurophysiology, so my credentials are okay in terms of uh, the debate. I'm going to try to uh, persuade you that neuroscience not only does not, but will never explain human consciousness. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, uh, and you, perhaps you were expecting an hour, perhaps you were hoping it's going to be 10 minutes, uh, but uh, 40 minutes is certainly short of the hour, and then David is going to uh, pick up and, and, and run with the kind of things that I say. And I hope, collectively, you will give me a hard time, because I know my views are unacceptable to many people, including many neuroscience colleagues, and I'm indeed I'm regarded as a heretic, and indeed probably regarded as a religious believer, which I'm not, a dualist, which I'm not, or creationist lover, which I'm not. No, 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 no. I am a totally regular guy. The person I to is not swivel eyed so there you go. And therefore, I, in fact, nearly all of my research in my 30 plus years as a physician uh, was in neuroscience. Ah, oh, thanks very much indeed. See, well, what cooperation, I mean, what you could have done with actually the whole of my.
that if a moon lights up and I feel sad, the feeling of sadness is the brain lighting up. And this confusion, alas, has led to all sorts of pseudosciences which are now invading uh, the humanities, which are now trying to become animalities. So we have neuroesthetics, neurolaw, neuroeconomics, neurosociology, neuropolitics, neurotheology, and so vita. Now, I don't believe that the failure to provide a neuroscientific account with sufficient conditions of consciousness and conscious behaviour is a temporary state of affairs. I do not expect that the gap between neuroscientific stories of human behaviour and the standard humanist or common sense narrative will be closed or even narrowed as neuroscience advances. And I don't think for a moment that technologies such as fMRI scanning will actually close that gap even if they become more complex and more sophisticated. And I have to tell you, a lot of my own research involved fMRI scanning, so I can tell you not only how good it is, but also how bad it is. I want to give you good principled reasons for asserting that not only do we not presently have a neuroscientific account of, or explanation of human consciousness, but also we will never do so. Reasons, that is to say, for rejecting the belief that we shall eventually be able to cash out the notions of mind and behaviour in terms of neural activity. And I'm going to focus on human consciousness because misrepresenting human consciousness may have more calamitous consequences than misrepresenting animal consciousness. And also because I don't want to get caught up in empty arguments about the nature of animal consciousness and where we draw the line between sentient and insentient creatures. And anyway, it is human consciousness that underlies the difficulty of fitting consciousness into the natural world as understood through physical, that is to say, material science. Incorrectly identifying the mind with the brain, or consciousness with brain activity, has two important undesirable consequences. <coughs> if we are our brains, and our brains are evolved organs, designed to maximise the chances of our survival, as they most surely are, then we are beasts like any other, subject to the biological drivers that drive apes and centipedes. And if we are our brains, and our brains are material objects, as they most surely are, then we and our lives are merely waste stations, in the great causal net that is the universe, stretching from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch. Interestingly, most of those who sign up to neuroevolutionary accounts of humanity don't seem to recognise these consequences. Not that these unpleasant consequences will be an argument against the mind-brain identity theory. <coughs> Truths are no less true for being upsetting. After all, I know that I'm going to die just because I find that idea upsetting doesn't mean to say that I have to assert it's untrue. But the notion that human consciousness is identical with brain activity just happens to be untrue. Now, one final preliminary comment. When you point out that there are certain characteristics central to our humanity that neuroscience can't explain, neurophilosophers and neuromythologists and all the other characters respond in one of two ways. The first is the claim that I've already addressed that one day, one fine day, it will be able to explain these things. It's just a matter of time and technology. The other is to declare that those things that neuroscience cannot grasp, they already exist. And this is particularly li likely to be reckoned to the self. Where in the brain is the first person? Where is the eye to be found? <coughs> Nowhere, though it's an illusion. And also directed to free will. How, in a material object, can you find a point where actions are initiated? Nowhere. So freedom <coughs> is another illusion. My feeling is that we should reject the argument that if neuroscience can't see it, then it doesn't exist. After all, neuroscientists themselves don't apply the argument consistently. They don't doubt that they think that they are selves, or have the illusion that they act freely, and yet there is no conceivable neural explanation of these indubitably real phenomena. Consciousness of material objects. Straightforward perception is a good place to start. After perception, I'm going to discuss the relationship or non-relationship between physical science and phenomenal consciousness, and what I call the disappearance of appearance. I want to extend this to underline the extent to which the very notion of matter is viewpointless. Then I'm going to talk about the unity and multiplicity of consciousness. Next, I'll discuss memory and have a quick sideline glance at the self, because these are things that neuroscience cannot even begin to deal with. And I should finally really say something about voluntary action and free will and so on, but these are really topics for another talk. But finally, I'm going to ask where, since we're all agreed, or if you're all agreed, that neuroscience doesn't explain human consciousness, and you should be agreed, you should agree with this after the powerful arguments in my talk, we go from here. Where do we go from here? How do we account for the pivotal role of the brain in our awareness and behaviour? How do we find the <coughs> of mind in the largely mindless material world in which we live?
of which we are a part. Now, my critique of the neural theory of consciousness will be based upon taking seriously its own declared philosophy. And on this, I appeal to no less authority than Daniel Burnett, one of the most prominent spokespersons for the neuroevolutionary reduction of human beings and their minds. And I quote, and we'll get out with the expression, there's only one sort of stuff, namely matter, the physical stuff of physics, chemistry, and physiology. And the mind is somehow nothing but a physical phenomenon. In short, the mind is the brain. We can, in principle, account for every mental phenomenon using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain radioactivity, continental drift, photosynthesis, reproduction, nutrition, and growth. So, when we're talking about the brain, he will tell us we are talking about a piece of matter. And if we keep this in mind, we have enough ammunition to demonstrate the necessary failure of neuroscientific accounts of consciousness and conscious behavior. So let's begin with perception, as it is experienced in humans. The explicit sense of being aware of something other than myself. <coughs> Consider my awareness of a glass in front of you. Now, the standard account says that my perception of the glass is the result of the light reflected in the glass entering my eyes and triggering activity in my visual pathway. There is an unbroken causal chain connecting the glass with neural activity in my brain. This chain of causes and effects is entirely compatible with, to reiterate Dennett's words, the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain everything else in the material universe. <coughs> Unfortunately, for neuroscientism, the inward causal path from the glass to my brain does not deliver my awareness of the glass as an item explicitly separate from me, as over there, with respect to myself, is over here. There is nothing in the activity in the visual cortex which would make that activity be about the things that I see, about something other than itself. The inward causal chain explains how the light gets into my brain, but not how this results in a gaze that looks out. In other words, we have something fundamental that is left unexplained. And this is what philosophers call the intentionality that makes the activity, supposedly in the visual cortex, be about the glass over there. And I'm talking about full-blown intentionality, not the kind of putative proto-intentionality that may be ascribed <coughs> to non-human sentient creatures. Intentionality is utterly mysterious, not the least because it points in the opposite direction to causality, in the opposite direction to the causal chain that passes into the visual cortex, through it to other parts of the cortex, and eventually to those parts of the brain that are associated with motor activity. Intentionality is not feedback, Intentionality is not reverse causation. Rather, it is something that opens up an otherwise causally closed, closed world. It is a tear in the fabric of that world. Let's tease out this mystery a bit more, if only to prevent materialists from doing their usual trick of burying intentionality into causation, hurrying past perception to its behavioral consequences, so that they can ignore the counter-causal direction that intentionality must take if one really believes that perception of material <coughs> effects in one place, the brain, of material causes, in another, the object. My perception of the glass requires the neural activity in the visual cortex to reach causally upstream to the events that cause them. And this is utterly mysterious. But it immediately raises two questions that a child might ask. Firstly, why does the backward glance of a set of effects to some of their causes stop at a particular point in the causal chain? In this case, the object, the glass. Evolutionary theory doesn't explain how these breaks emerge, as it deals only with forward causation. And secondly, how does this backward reaching break a solid <coughs> object out of something as unstable as <coughs> interference with the light? The ordinary inference, implicit in everyday perception that the events causally upstream of the nerve impulses <coughs> are manifestations of something that transcends those events, namely manifestations of an object that is J.S. Mill said, the permanent possibility of other experiences makes intentionality even more mysterious. <coughs> this bounce back, where causes reach up to their ancestors in the causal chain, marks the point at which sense experiences are, as it were, received, and where, 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 where by a variety of inter intermediate steps, they can trigger behavior outwards. Without this bounce back, there will be no demarcation within the causal nexus between 